So today we'll, uh, we'll carry on our discussion about the key macroeconomic variables. Um, but before we start, let's just uh, quickly look at what we covered last lecture. So last lecture we talked about what is macroeconomics. We talked about the difference between macro and macro. What should we expect in this module about teaching, um, assessment, feedback, the topics we will cover, etc., the textbook. And then we, we finished last, uh, last time we met, we finished off with um, a tour of the world economy which, in which we talked about the global financial crisis. We tried to look at the same uh, or the key macro variables during, before the crisis, during the crisis, and after the crisis in the US economy, uh, in the uh, European area, and in China. So the lecture recording is now online on Hanomics, on my YouTube channel. So um, I also um, I also created a folder um, on uh, uh, Blackboard with the lecture recording. So um, it will have all the links to the lecture um, from uh, the, the recording from the, uh, from the from last uh, last time. So today. As I said, we will carry on our discussion about these macroeconomic variables, and these are the topics that I want to cover today. So basically, we talked about aggregate output, we talked about GDP, uh, inflation, unemployment rate. We really want to understand more about these key, um, key variables. So we we'll start with the GDP or aggregate output. Remember when what we said last time? We said basically how we can um, monitor um, or make any uh, conclusion or statement about the economic performance in a given country, we usually, the first thing we, we look at as macroeconomists or economists, we look at the GDP or the gross domestic product or the aggregate output. This is how much a country uh, produces in a given year. So just Following a very simple example, just to show you how GDP is calculated. So let's assume that there is a country in which there are only two firms, firm one and firm two. Firm one produces steel, firm two produces uh, cars. And firm one, the sales for firm one is 100 pound, while the sales for firm two is 200 pound. Okay, we're just trying to see how we're going, if this is the uh, what we produce in, in, in this economy, how are we going to calculate the gross domestic product or the, uh, the aggregate output in, in this country? Okay, so to produce this for both firms, what they do, so they, 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 they have costs as well. So they, the expenses here in um, firm one is 80 pound, in firm two is 170 pound, and this expenses in firm one is just wages, how much they they pay to uh, labor or workers. Firm two pays 70 pounds to, to workers. But in addition to that, to produce cars, you need steel. So they actually buy also steel from firm one. So this is the steel purchase, which is 100 uh, pounds. So the total expenses here for firm two is 170. For firm one is 80, uh, 80 pounds. So how much these firms, how much profit these firms make Obviously, what you need to do is just subtract. It's 100 pound for firm one minus 80. That gives us 20 pound. On the other side, again, you can so revenue mi uh, minus expenses that will give you how much profit they make. So, what is the GDP here? What is the aggregate output here in this economy in which we assume that there are only two firms? Okay, is it the total of the output here, which which include like 100 pound? Revenues, um, revenue from, from sales in, in, in firm one and 200 uh, from firm two, does that make it 300 uh, pound that GDP in this country in, in this given year? Or it is only the 200 pound from, um, from the second firm? Just remember, that will take us to the very important point about calculating GDP that we actually look only at the final goods. So still here, the steel Porsches here is, is this is this is intermediate good. This is an intermediate good which has been used to produce cars. So if I if I say the GB here is 100 pound plus 200 pound, that means I actually calculated steel twice because 
the 200 pound sales from firm two already included the price of steel or how much steel cost that. Okay, so basically in that case, the GDP here is the value of the final good here, which is the cars, the value of how much uh, revenue came from selling cars, which is 200 pounds. So the GDP in this case is 200 pounds. So that is, that is the main idea. So when you, when you calculate GDP, when you think about GDP, you need to exclude uh, intermediate goods. You look only at final goods. Okay, and in our case here is 200 pounds. So 200 pounds here, in our very naive and simple example, is the GDP or the aggregate output or the gross domestic product for this country in this, in this year. So it's 200 pounds. Why? Because this is the value of the final goods. So final goods here are cars, not uh, uh, steel. So that will take us the formal definition of what GDP is, what the gross domestic product is. As, we, as I said, it's the value of final goods and services produced in an economy during a given period, usually uh, a year. And, 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 and that means we, we exclude, we, also, we, we only count final goods, so we exclude intermediate, uh, intermediate goods. So goods that are or that have been used in producing other goods. Okay, so basically we look here at only cars because we know that steel is part of the car. So it's an intermediate good, so we don't count this one. So, in, 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 just in following the same example, so if we were to merge these two companies to form a new company, the revenue from that company would be only 200, so that's the GDP. Okay, so that is the idea because we're looking at the final, the value of the final goods. So there's another way to calculate GDP by looking at the value added. So when you look at the value added, let's just follow the, which again is the value of production minus the value of intermediate product. So following the same example, so we have the same two firms here. So what we have here, let's assume that, okay, let's assume that the first firm didn't have any input from anywhere else, so their value added is 100. So 100 is zero, oh, that they, they had nothing, so they didn't use any intermediate good. It's a very silly assumption, but just to make the point clear. The second firm produced 200, but then they used 100 pound, what was worth 100 pound of steel. So that means the difference between both the 200 and the 100 is, is the value added in this case. So basically the GDP according to this uh, method of calculating GDP is 100 pound value added from firm one, plus 100 pound added from uh, value added in, in firm two. So again, it gives us the same number, okay? So whatever method you use to calculate the GDP, it should be exactly the same number. So it's 200, uh, 200 pound. Again, we, this is according to the value added. So how much value they add to the production. So it's the total, the value of production minus in, any intermediate goods uh, you've used, the value of any intermediate goods uh, you have used. So just remember the assumption I made about steel, so they had zero input from this, so they didn't use any uh, intermediate goods. So a third way to calculate the same thing, the GDP, so so far we've been looking from the production side, so we look at the total value of the final goods or the uh, value added or the sum of the value added, but we could actually also look from the income side. So if you sum or, or if you add up all incomes in, in an economy, that will give you the GDP and should be the same. So in that case, we'll follow the same example. In that case, where are the incomes here? Wages. So firm one paid 80 pound wages, firm two uh, paid 70 pound wages. So that makes 150 and also profits. 20 plus 30, that's 50, and if you add these up together, that gives you uh, 200, which is exactly the same, the same number. So, so far now we understand our three, three ways or three methods of calculating GDP, following a very simple example, but that apply to um, a, a real case or a, a real economy, so it's the same way. So what we do, so we, you either like sum up the, um, the value of the final goods, so you exclude intermediate goods, or you look at the value added, so the production, the value of the production minus the value of uh, any intermediate goods. Or the third way is just to add up all incomes, okay? And that should give you the same, uh, the same number. So that's the aggregate output or the gross domestic product or GDP. So now, to calculate the GDP now, so we look at quantities 
That's the value of the production. Yes, so you need the quantities and you need the prices. So we have two components here when you calculate GDP, quantities and prices. So that means if or for that GDP to increase, one of these change or the quantities, either the quantities or the prices or even both, when they change that, the GDP will, uh, will increase. So that will take us to this um, uh, important concept that, that we should understand, the difference between nominal uh, GDP and real GDP. So the one I've been talking about now, when I just multiply quantities by prices, that's the nominal GDP, where I'm using the current prices. So every year, I'm using the prices from that year times the quantities, so how many um, uh, units or how many uh, how much we, we produce time the prices that would give us the GDP in that year okay but again as I said because prices can change so that means the GDP that known as GDP can increase just because of change in prices but what we care about is the change in output so we want to see how much quantities have changed okay and that takes us to the real GDP and it's very simple. So the real GDP, you, take, you do the same thing. You have the quantities, but then you multiply this by constant prices. So you don't change the price. So for example, if I want to use the prices from 2010, so I'm just going to um, use the quantities from 2019 times the prices in 2010, or the quantities in 2020 times the prices in uh, 20, uh, 2010. So again, so I'm just fixing the prices these are the constant prices, and that will give me the real change or the real uh, GDP at that, in, in, in that year. So this is a very, um, again, very simple example to show you if we produce only cars in an economy. So um, and this, this how much cars we produced in, in, in 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and, and on the third column, you have the prices of cars. So to calculate the nominal GDP is very straightforward. You just multiply quantities times price times prices. Okay, so that is very straightforward. The nominal GDP because you're using the prices from that year. However, if you want to to know to, to calculate the real GDP, you just need to fix the prices or use constant prices. Okay, in this example, I use the prices in 2009. So I multiplied the quantities in 2008 by the prices of 2009. The same thing in 2009, the same thing in, in 2010, that gave us the real GDP. And obviously, because, we, because I used the prices for 2009, so that means the nominal GDP and the real GDP are the same in 2009, because I'm using the prices of 2009. Okay? Is that clear? So the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP. So the idea, are you using the current prices? or using constant prices, okay? So if you're using current prices, that's nominal GDP. If you're using constant prices, that's real GDP, okay? So we usually care about the real GDP because we want to monitor the change in quantities, how much output really we, we produce, whether it has increased or decreased. And that, that, uh, that graph shows you the um, both nominal and real GDP in, um, in the US between 1960 to 2014 and you can see that um, the red line here it's not very red but you know what I mean so um, no actually it looks red on the projector it doesn't look red on my screen so that, that one here is the real GDP using the 2009 prices okay you see that the both nominal and uh, real uh, GDP lines, the in, uh, the, there's intersection here at some point, and guess which point is that? So what is that point? Why they they cross like this at this point? Does anyone know? No. No. The, when they intersect, that means both are equal. So when they both known as GDP equal real GDP, when? In this example. So when they are both are the same. In 2009, why? Because the constant price is here 2009, so my, my base year, or the, 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 I'm fixing the price at 2009. 
So at this point, because I'm using the prices from 2009, so both are the same at this point. Okay? So, but before that, sorry, before that, you see real GDP is above nominal GDP, so it's higher. Why? Because the prices in 2009 are higher than any year before. So that's why you multiply that by quantity that you see. It's, it's higher, real GDP is higher than nominal GDP. But after that, you'll see it below the nominal GDP. Okay? Because prices increase over time. Okay? And that's why. So that point here, so if I used 2005 prices, so if I, if I calculated real GDP using 2005 prices, so that means these two lines will intersect actually, which will cross at 2005 in that year. Okay, so that's the idea because I'm using the prices for that year. Okay, so anyway, so that will take us to another very important exam, um, uh, concept, which is GDP growth. Remember, I say what we care about is the uh, change in quantities or the real changes in GDP. So, because if you just look at the nominal GDP, that number could just change because the change in price, not, not necessarily the quantity. So that doesn't mean the output has, has changed at all or has increased at all. Okay, So that's why we look at the real GDP. So re, uh, the GDP growth, we look at that real GDP, which is certainly denoted here as YT. So YT, this one here, is uh, real GDP in time T. Time T could be any year or any quarter or any month. <coughs> depending on how, you, uh, how often you, or the frequency of the, uh, this series. And then minus t minus one. So let's say we, we're dealing with annual data. So we want to know the growth rate, the GDP growth rate in 2020. So how would we calculate that? So it's going to be real GDP in 2020 minus real GDP in 2019. So the year before, that's t minus one, divided by the GDP from last year, that will give us the growth, the growth rate, GDP growth rate, okay? So the graph you see here show you the growth rate, uh, the GDP growth rate in, in the US between 1960 and 2014, and you can see um, all the whole period here, you see most of the time um, the growth rate is positive, it's only negative here at the financial crisis time, and at sometimes in 1980s. Okay, but apart from these two, you see most of the time here GDP growth is, is positive. So it's, that means the economy is growing, then the economy is, is expanding. Okay, so again, so the main message here, how we calculate the GDP growth. So it's YT minus, YT minus 1 divided by YT minus 1. So again, GDP this year minus GDP last year divided by GDP last year. Okay, and again, I'm talking about real GDP. I'm not talking about nominal GDP. So hopefully now we know the difference between nominal and, and real. This is very important. So nominal, you use quantities, can, quantities multiplied by or times current prices. Real, you use quantities multiplied by constant prices. So you have a base year. In our example, it was 2009. It could be any other, any other year. It doesn't have to be 2009. Okay, it could be any year, as long as you just fix it. So you use that base prices or that, that price from that base year for the whole series. And that will give you the, um, the uh, real GDP. Okay, so that's the first concept, the GDP. So how we calculate the GDP? Three methods, you remember? So you, you, you add up all, the, all the, 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 the value of the all final goods, okay, in a given year. Or you could, you look at just the value added, so you add up the value added, okay, and we know how we calculate the value added, just the, the value of production minus the value of intermediate goods. Or the third method to calculate GDP is just adding up all incomes. Okay? And that will give you, and three methods should give you the same number. It should be, is, it should be the same thing. And then we learn the difference between nominal and real GDP, and then how we calculate the GDP growth. That's everything we said so far. Okay? So now moving to unemployment. Unemployment we need to learn a few um, things about like main concepts. So basically, employment is just the number of people who have a job, and let's call it N. Then unemployment should be the number of 
people who do not have a job but looking for a job. Because to define unemployment is very important to understand that we count only those who are looking for jobs, those who are ready to take a job, those who are willing to, 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 to work, those who are actively seeking or looking for a job. Okay? If any of these uh, 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 conditions is missing, that means you're not part of un the unemployment or the unemployed. So labor force basically is the sum of both. The unemployed, so the number of people who are unemployed plus the number of people who are employed. That's the labor force. So it's N plus U. So L here is the labor force. Um, that means the number of people who are uh, part of the labor force that include both those who are employed plus those who are uh, not employed but looking for a job. So they, they are able to take the job and they are, they are looking for, for, for a job. So when we talk about those who are able to take a job, basically we exclude young people, like not my children, so children are not supposed to, to work, and those who are maybe above 65. Okay, so again, these are outside the uh, waging, uh, uh, working age population. So that's, that's, that's the segment we look at here. So the say from 20, uh, sometimes like some definition will tell you from 24 to 65. Okay, um, so it depends on, on, on the definition. Really. But at the end of the day, we understand the point. The point here is we look at those who are willing to work, those who can work, and then they look for, for work. So they are either in a job, so they are employed, or not in a job that then they are counted as unemployed. So how we get the, the calculate the unemployment rate then? So the unemployment rate is the ratio of those who are unemployed divided by um, those number of people who are in the labor force. That would give us that U small here, this small letter here, where is it? this one, just denote the unemployment rate. That, that big letter here, U, that means this is the number of people who are unemployed. Okay, so this is the discharge workers. So those who give up looking for a job, so they didn't have a job and they just give up. So these no longer part counted as unemployed. Okay, since they no longer looking for a job, or those may be those who are wealthy to not work at all, so they voluntarily just choose not to, to work. So again, these are not counted as unemployed. Okay, so it's very, very specific uh, definition, so you, you've got to be uh, careful about this thing. And then the last thing is the participation rate. Okay, so the participation rate basically is the ratio of labor force um, to total population of working age. So Population of working age, as we said, so again, you exclude children or elderly people who are maybe older than 65. So these are just key concepts. If you talk about unemployment, so you have to really understand the differences between these uh, different concepts. So how we collect data to um, calculate the unemployment rate, okay, so usually, Unemployment rate is based on large surveys, so they meet households and they ask questions with, our, I mean, of course, different sort of questions, but part of these questions is, do you have a job or not? So if you're not having, if you, if you don't have a job, how long have you been looking for a job? Okay, so basically here, so we use this large surveys uh, where they interview households to compute the unemployment rate. Um, you are counted unemployed, or a person is counted as unemployed, okay, um, if they have been looking for a job for uh, over the last four weeks, okay. Again, that can that might change from um, 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 in different definitions, but the majority or many countries actually adopt this this definition. So you are counted as unemployed if in the if in the um, in the survey, you reported that you've been, you, ha you don't have a job and you've been looking or searching for a job for the last four weeks at least. So that means you are counted among those who are unemployed. So in the US, this survey called the Current Population Survey, CPS, and they interview 60,000 households every month. So based on this data, they come up with the unemployment rate. Okay, in the UK, it's called labor force survey, and this they interview thirty-seven thousand households every quarter. 
Okay, and if you click here, this is a link just to learn more about the labor force survey. Okay, in the UK. So at the end of the day, just this is how unemployment is unemployment rate is is, is calculated. Again, it's, it it is based on household surveys, really massive, large household surveys. Okay, um, we explained that before. So if you don't have a job but you're not looking for a job, then you're not counted as part of the labor force because for whatever reason, whether you are a discouraged worker who um, has been looking for a job and then at some point just gave up, he didn't find a job and he gave up, or maybe you're wealthy enough or whatever reason uh, your reasons are, just you just <coughs> voluntarily choosing to be, uh, to be unemployed. So in that case, you're not really counted as active or as part of the labor uh, uh, force. Anyway, so why do we care about unemployment? Obviously, unemployment has negative effects on the unemployed people, especially if they remain unemployed for, for a long time. And also, it's a signal for the whole economy that uh, this economy is not using its human resources efficiently. Remember, one of the, or the, 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 at the core of economics, is the economic problem. So we have resources, we have limited resources and unlimited wants. So we really want to make the most of the resources we have. And part of these resources are obviously humans. So human capital here or human resources should be uh, 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 utilized efficiently, uh, should be used efficiently. That means they shouldn't be unemployed. However, very low unemployment rate can also be uh, a sign that the economy runs into labor shortage. So we need uh, uh, workers that we can find. So again, so this is um, about the effect of unemployment. So that's, that is the um, unemployment rate in the US since um, from 1960 to 2014. And you can see here it's been fluctuating around like from kind of 3% three, 3 up to 10%, so obviously, unemployment increased during recession, and you can see here, the highest unemployment rate here was during the global financial crisis, which was hit about 10%, or 11%, or 10%, I think. Um, and this is something expected, and of course, in, in good times, okay, in, in, in booms, or in good times, okay, then when, when, when the economy, is in, in good shape, then you, you would imagine that unemployment rate would be low. Okay. Um, there's a study who shows, well, which shows that the, the relationship between uh, life satisfaction, so on, on this, uh, on the vertical axis, we have life satisfaction index, and this is the unemployment, um, the, the, the time of being unemployed. So it, it shows that as you go to the, the, become unemployed here, so the years, even the years before, oh sorry, the time before that, could be a month or quarters, I don't remember the study, so your life satisfaction drop or your happiness becomes less, and that even continues after, um, after you, you find a job. So it has like a long lasting impact on those who are um, unemployed. So, again, let's just, look back at what we will want to know about uh, unemployment. So there are come some key concepts that we should, we should learn about. What do you mean by uh, employment? Obviously people who have jobs, unemployed are the number of people who don't have jobs, and then labor force, then you, you sum these together that give you the labor force. Okay? Unemployment rates, so you divide the number of those who are unemployed by the number of people in the labor force that give you the employment rate. Discouraged workers, obviously those who just give up looking for a job, and these are not counted as part of the labor work, so what, they're, not, they're not active anymore. Participation rate, it's the ratio of the labor force uh, to total uh, population uh, of working uh, age, how we collect uh, data, you have a link here if you want to really know more about how the UK uh, collect data for unemployment. The effect of unemployment, obviously you'd imagine if those, how, how unemployment affects um, uh, the unemployed, and obviously would imagine also the unemployment is kind of connected to the 
uh, GDP or to the shape of the economy. So if the, the economy is doing well, that means unemployment rate would be very low. If the economy is doing uh, uh, really bad, then obviously the, you, you'd imagine that unemployment rate will be uh, very high. And we saw like some studies already linked um, link unemployment to uh, happiness. So obviously unemployment would have negative impact on, on happiness or life satisfaction. Okay. So the third point that we would like, I would like to cover is inflation. So, so far we talked about GDP, we talked about <coughs> unemployment. When we talked about GDP, we know how to calculate GDP. Okay, there are three methods. Do you remember? So, the value of all final goods in a given uh, uh, year. Or you can just add up all the value added. So value added here means you look at the production minus intermediate goods. Or you could look at from the income side. So you just sum up all incomes. That will give you the GDP. So three methods should give you the same number. And then we know the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP. Nominal GDP because it's quantity times price. So use the quantity times the current prices. Okay, real GDP is quantities times constant prices. You don't change the, you don't change the, the prices. So you use the, the prices from a base year, and at that base year, both nominal and real GDP should be the same. Okay, and then we learn how to calculate GDP growth. Okay, and when we talk about GDP growth, we are looking at real GDP. That's what we care about. We care about the change in output and aggregate output. We're looking at Q or quantities. Okay, so in that in that case, then the growth rate is just y t minus y t minus one. So real GDP in time t or real GDP this year minus real GDP last year divided by year real GDP last year, which the formula you've seen. So y t minus y t minus one divided by or over y t minus one. Okay. And then we talk about unemployment, a number of concepts that we need to understand, and then how we calculate the unemployment rate, how we collect data for, to calculate the unemployment rate. We, most countries rely on uh, these large surveys, and so how this happened in the US and in, in the UK. And then obviously, we imagine, as we can imagine, unemployment has negative impact on happiness or on the unemployed in general. And we saw some studies already documented this sort of evidence of um, negative relationship between unemployment and happiness or life satisfaction. So moving now to inflation, uh, which we already touched on in the last, <coughs> last uh, uh, lecture. So inflation basically, or a very simple definition, is a sustained rise in the general <coughs> level of prices or the price level. Okay, So when prices of most goods just increase. Um, inflation rate, of course, this is the rate at which the price level increases. Uh, deflation is the opposite. So we have a sustained decline. So inflation is a sustained rise in the price level. Deflation is just moving the other direction, where you have a sustained decline in the price level. So kind of, we can think of it as negative inflation rate. Okay. You, how we calculate the inflation rate? There are two ways to do that. One, because what we, need to know, what we need to do here is to calculate the price level, okay? So there are two ways to get an idea about the, the general level of prices or the price level. One is to use the, what we call the GDP deflator. And the GDP deflator here, so and this will give you the, the price, uh, the price level, which is basically the nominal GDP <coughs> divided by the real GDP, okay? And whenever you see like a dollar sign or a pound sign in front of uh, Y, that means this is the nominal GDP. Okay? So this one, Y just without any dollar sign or, or, or um, pound sign, so that means this is, the I mean, the real GDP. Okay? So what we have here is nominal GDP divided by real GDP. That would give us PT, which is, again, this is just a kind of index. It doesn't have any economic interpretation. What we care about is the change, uh, the rate of change of this PT, okay? Which would give us the inflation rate. So if we get the price even using this, and then pi here is the inflation rate in time t, this one here. So and 
is very, is very uh, simple how you calculate it. So it's PT minus PT minus 1. So the price level in time T minus the price level in time T minus 1 divided by the price level in time T. Okay. This is one way. So the, the GDP deflator, okay, so uh, this should be T minus 1, not price T. Um, the GDP deflator, so again, so to calculate inflation, so we care about the price level. So one way is look at the GDP deflator, or the other way is to look at the uh, CPI. So the CPI here, or the consumer price index, it's just, if you can imagine you have a basket of goods, okay, that um, we use to calculate the price level. So every, every month or every quarter or every year, I mean usually every month. So what happened here is that you just calculate the price or you collect data about the price of all items in this basket. Okay, that will give us the price level. Okay. So again, all what we, we do, rather than dividing the nominal GDP by the real GDP, okay, all what we do here with the consumer price index, you have a basket of items or goods that uh, people buy or consumers uh, uh, buy, then you just collect data um, on a monthly basis uh, on how much the prices of these items are. And then that will give you the, um, the uh, uh, CPI. Again, we're not, so the CPI itself is not the inflation rate. You need to use this formula here, again, to, to calculate the, the inflation rate, okay? So again, but P here, or the price level, it's just based on the CPI, not GDP deflated. So it's the same, the same, the same concept. That would give us the, um, um, the inflation rate. And as I said, the US, in, um, in the US, they, they publish the, inflation rate uh, monthly and it's uh, based on the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. What they do is the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, what it does, it collects price data for 211 items in 38 cities. So if you click here, you get more information about how they do that and what products or what items are uh, in this basket. In the UK, they do the same monthly and it is um, published by the Office for National Statistics, ONS. And again, you could just learn more about how they do that and what products are in this basket. Okay? So, but it, the general, the, the, the main concept is very simple. So, you want to know the price level. So, inflation is all about the sustained rise in, in the price level. So, we want to know the price level. So, that's Two, there are two ways now to know the price level. So you could just look at the GDP deflator. So you divide the uh, nominal GDP over the real GDP. So we know how to calculate nominal GDP and real GDP now. And then calculate the inflation rate. Or you could just use the CPI and, uh, uh, again, use the same formula to calculate the inflation rate. This figure here show you the uh, CPI or the inflation rate based on the CPI and GDP. So the blue one, the blue line here is the inflation rate in the US based on the CPI and the, the red color, the red line is the inflation rate based on the, um, uh, the GDP deflator. And you can see that both move together. They are very, very close, closely related, except like there are a few exceptions maybe during 1980s uh, or 1979, and that was because of the price of imported goods increased relative to the price of domestically produced goods. And, and, but apart from this year, they generally very, very close. So there's one more thing to, to know about before, um, before we move to the next point, is, which is, why do we care about inflation? When Last time when I asked people, would you like to see the price level increasing? Uh, the answer was no. You don't want that price level to increase because that affects you directly. And that affects your real income. So basically, the purchasing power or how much you can buy using your income. But how about if both increased at the same percentage? So you have the same percentage increase 
in both prices and wages or incomes. So in that case, you'll see that you're not going to feel any change because you have the same uh, uh, purchasing power. You, 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 the relative prices are not affected. I mean, you can buy with your income, you can buy the same uh, basket or the same, uh, so your real wage hasn't changed. And there's like a debate around this sort of concept, pure conflation, that, uh, pure inflation. So pure inflation, that means proportional increase in all prices and wages. Okay, so the prices go up and wages go up, so they kind of cancel each other. So at the end of the day, your real wages the same. Okay, and this is a kind of an article related to that and whether that such concept exists or not, pure inflation. So, why should we care about inflation? So, with unemployment, it was very clear. The unemployment, unemployment has a, 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 a negative impact on the unemployed people, especially if they uh, continue to be or remain to be unemployed for a long time. Inflation hits everyone. Obviously, it affects your real income. Okay? So, how much you can buy with your income. Okay? If the price has changed and your income uh, hasn't changed, that means... You cannot buy the same amount as before, so you have to buy this. That means you are actually worse off. So inflation can affect everyone. Um, it also um, it can affect uh, what, what, what is it called the bracket creep um, in taxes. It can actually move you up in the um, to a higher tax bracket. Um, since that, if the prices increases. And income increases, but not as much. So at the end of the day, you are worse off because your real wage decreases. But at the same time, you actually move to a higher income bracket. That means you're paying more as taxes. So there are different, different reasons why inflation is, is a problem. Most people think, or most economists think, that the best inflation rate should be between 1% and 4%. And in the UK, the Bank of England target the 2% inflation rate if you and I think inflation rate this year is below that okay so but their target every year is kind of two percent so if you click here it will take you to more details about um, uh, the uh, Bank of England uh, inflation target which again as I said is two percent okay so uh, just to finish off today so what we what we did so far GDP, how we calculate GDP, the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP, how we calculate the GDP growth, unemployment, different concepts we learn about unemployment, how we calculate the unemployment rate, why, uh, why should we care about unemployment, and then we move to talk about inflation. What's inflation? Is a sustained rise in the price level, then how we calculate the price level, that is the point here. So there are two ways to do that. You could use the GDP deflator. So you divide nominal GDP over um, real GDP that give you the um, price level. And then you, from there you can calculate the inflation rate. So that the rate of change of these prices, that will give you the, the, um, will give you the inflation rate. Another way to do that, to, to calculate the price level, is to use the consumer price index, which is the CPI, and again, uh, CPI, you just, just imagine a basket of goods. So you have a number of goods in this basket. And all what you need to do is just to collect data about the prices of this, these goods or these items uh, 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 on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. And from there, you can calculate the rate of change or the, the inflation rate of, of the, 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 the price level. And then we know, again, inflation has kind of a negative impact, but also we need to have a kind of a stable and low inflation rate. And as I said, in the UK, they target 2%, um, and at the moment, it's, it's below 2%. So the last thing I, would, um, I want to cover today is two points, actually, not one. So the relationship between unemployment and GDP, and the relationship between uh, inflation rate and unemployment rate. So the first one is Oaken's Law. The second one is Phillips curve. Okay, so these are two different studies that <coughs> observed and document some sort of relationship between uh, these variables. As you can imagine, we said that already. In good times, what should we expect about unemployment rate? 
So if you have high GDP growth, the good time, the economy is growing, is expanding. So that means there are jobs for everyone, most people. That means unemployment rate should be low. And the other way, so in recession time, in bad time, then the economy is not producing enough jobs to everyone. So that means higher unemployment rate. And that's exactly what Oakland's law says. Okay, so when you have a growth uh, rate that is higher than usual, this is usually associated with uh, lower unemployment rate. So this is kind of a negative or downward sloping uh, uh, line here, which if you see the, on the horizontal axis, we have output growth. And on the vertical axis, we have um, unemployment rate, and it's kind of negative relationship. And the slope of that line here is, is minus 0.4, which means if GDP increases, if GDP growth increases by 1%, unemployment rate will decrease by 0.4%. The other relationship, which is between uh, inflation rate and unemployment rate, again, this is known as uh, Phillips curve. So this, this relationship between unemployment and growth rate is known as Oaken's law. And this one, the relationship between inflation rate and unemployment rate is known as Phillips curve. And again, it's a downward sloping uh, 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 curve. Um, so that means there's a negative relationship between uh, unemployment and, um, and uh, uh, inflation rate. So higher unemployment leads on average to a decrease in inflation and, and vice versa. So the last point, so these are how these two variables uh, interact. So the relationship between unemployment rate and uh, GDP growth, it's negative relationship. So at higher level of growth rate, then you would imagine that unemployment rate will, 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 will drop, uh, will fall. And if you have a higher employment rate, you would imagine uh, uh, the inflation rate is low and, and vice versa. So just now to uh, finish off this lecture with um, the last point, when we talk about the roadmap of our uh, course this semester, we said we, we're going to look at the short run, the medium run, and the long run. So we would like to just briefly here, um, I'd like to mention how really output change over this, this time frame. So at the short run, let's think of the short run as a few years. So the year-to-year -year changes in output are primarily driven by demand. So you have high demand, then you, GDP increases, you have low demand, or when you, demand decreases, that, and that again, that's in the short run. When you look at the medium run, so let's say a, a decade, so in that case, or in that time frame, output is uh, mainly driven by supply factors. So rather than demand, you look at the capital stock technology or the level of technology, uh, uh, the size of labor force, etc. When you look at how the economy um, uh, uh, what the economy depends on in, in the long run, so if you, if you look at a few decades or more, so it's a longer period, the economy depends on more the innovation and the quality of institutions. So the quality of education system, the quality of government, etc. Okay, so it's more about innovation, technologies, education system, um, uh, government. So that's what I call the uh, institution. So this is just again just to summarize what we or to give an idea about what we what we we're looking for. So what's next? We have. So that's everything I want to mention this lecture. So in this lecture, we talked about GDP. Unemployment, inflation, Oaken's low, and we, we, we looked at the time frame. Next lecture, we'll talk about the goods market. Uh, please read chapter three for the next lecture. Any questions? Okay, thank you. See you next week. Have a nice weekend.